I have here with me a copy of John Holt's How Children Learn and this is the revised edition because he wrote this book in the 60s and then he came back and reviewed his own writing again in the 80s and it's fascinating to me that it's not fascinating it's wonderful to me that he recognized that with a further 20 years in his field observing and practicing he was willing to recant a lot of his initial observations or not only to build upon them but also to say yeah you know what I think I misunderstood this at the time or I think I've made a, a misassumption here so here's what I think with another 20 years of wisdom and look if I can learn from someone else's 20 years of hard slog I feel like that's clever I, I don't really want to spend another 20 years of my life working all this stuff out for myself I'd rather catch ideas of someone who's done it all before and then try and apply those principles or keep circling back to those ideas and see if I can prove or refute them with my own experience. I have an excerpt to read to you, which I really liked and which I think is pertinent given the current concern about children maybe not being in their highly structured learning environments, but instead parents trying to juggle their own work commitments with their child's educational life. I find this reassuring and I hope that it might assuage some of the fears or the guilt or the worry or the stress that you may be feeling if remote learning isn't working out so easily for you. So here we go. This is John Holt's How Children Learn. Here is a copy of a letter written by the mother of a boy who is at one of the schools in which children are not required to attend classes but learn when and what they like with whatever help from the older people around them they may choose to ask for. The boy who had been having great difficulty in his conventional school and had not learned to read went to this school when he was seven. Two years later his mother wrote, he has not until the last month or so attended a single class Yet, in taking the standard achievement and IQ tests, we find he is reading into the 10th grade, doing math into the 9th grade, working with electronics and in several other areas that are not offered in public schools, even to the high school student. The electronics suggest how this seeming miracle was accomplished. There are no electronics manuals, texts and instruction books written for young children. Well, remember this is also dated. To use them, you must be able to read words like resistor, capacitator, potentiometer, and the like. No doubt this boy had to have help at first, but in learning to read the basic terms of electronics, he undoubtedly got enough information about letters and sounds to enable him to read any words he met. To work in electronics, you must also know arithmetic up through the decimals, so he had to learn that too, along with a good deal about electricity and electric circuits. Timetables! We act as if children were railroad trains running on a schedule. The railroad man figures that if his train is going to get to Chicago at a certain time, then it must arrive on time at every stop along the route. If it is 10 minutes late getting into a station, he begins to worry. In the same way, we often say that if children are going to know so much when they go to college, then they have to know this at the end of this grade and that at the end of that grade. If a child doesn't arrive at one of these intermediate stations when we think he should, we instantly assume he is going to be late at the finish. But children are not railway trains. They don't learn at an even rate. They learn in spurts. And the more interested they are in what they are learning, the faster these spurts are likely to be. Not only that, and this is an abridgment, not only that, but they often don't learn in what seems to us a logical sequence, by which we mean easy things first, hard things later. Being always seekers of meaning, children may first go to the hard things which have more meaning, or are, in paper's word, less dissociated from the world, and later from these hard things learn the easy ones. Thus, children who read well certainly know a lot of phonics, but they've probably learned as least as much phonics from words as they have learned words from phonics. No one taught me that the letters PH sound, say the sound I figured it out, probably from hard words like photograph and telephone. I think of an utterly hopeless student I once knew, now grown up and a skillful and successful commercial photographer, who when she first took up serious photography at age 14, learned in a few months, because she needed it, all the arithmetic she had never been able to learn in 10 years of school. Such stories are by no means rare. 
It may be true enough that in learning purely physical skills, such as sports, gymnastic, ballet, or playing musical instruments, though not even these are purely physical, nothing is. We generally have to learn easy movements before we learn hard ones. That is how the body works. But it is not how the mind works. What makes things easy or hard for our minds has very little to do with how little or how much information they may contain and everything to do with how interesting they are and to say it once again, how much sense they make, how connected they seem to reality. Now we return to his original text. This is not to say that all children left to learn on their own devices would find something that interested them as much as electronics interested the boy I just spoke of. It is to say that when they learn in their own way and for their own reasons, children learn so much more rapidly and effectively that we could possibly teach them that we can afford to throw away our curricula in our timetables and set them free, at least most of the time, to learn on their own. And now we have another edit or revision. I would now say all of the time, not most of the time. Children do not need to be made to learn, told what to learn or shown how, if we give them access to enough of the world, including our own lives and work in the world, they will see clearly enough what things are truly important to us and to others, and they will make for themselves a better path into that world than we could make for them. Nowhere is our obsession with timetables more needless and foolish than in reading. And then it goes on to discuss the process of reading, the acquisition of vocabulary, and the way in which it actually happens pretty naturally through everyday life. So, John Holt is interesting to me because beside being an educator and psychologist, he's also a cellist. And so he does talk a lot about experiments with his cello with young children, um, with confidence and the willingness to try. He talks of taking his cello into a preschool setting and offering it for anyone to try. Anyone can try. And without fail, every child in the room, every young child, four to six year old, wanted to try playing. And it's their approximation of playing. It may not actually look or sound like much, but in their head, they're pretty sure that they're playing and that they sound exactly like him playing Bach cello sonatas or concertos. The children were confident enough to try and to an adult's perception fail because they didn't produce anything that we recognized as music. In their mind, they succeeded. They were doing it. They're doing all the things, the bows on the strings. This is fantastic. The adults did not try and would not play the cello when offered unless they already had previous experience with a similar musical instrument. In other words, unless they thought they could do it, they wouldn't try and do it because they know what doing it or playing looks like, sounds like, constitutes, and they've already decided that that's not a skill they have. So I like um, the way he talks about experimentation and the willingness to learn and so much of this is what we already do in Suzuki. We talk about putting the music in the environment and giving the child access to other children already playing the repertoire so that they catch the desire to play. And there are plenty of children who for the first six months don't make any type of recognizable sound on their instrument. Um, I think that's fine. Different teachers have different views about this and set their children up differently. I think successive approximation is healthy and promotes a good attitude towards learning and capability, and I'm in it for the long haul. So that's my primary focus. Um, because we're encouraging this idea of successive approximation, we want to keep showing them the goal. And the goal is another child, not actually an adult, but another child, maybe a year older, maybe three years older, playing those pieces so that the student child wants to be like the, the model child. I want to do what they're doing. And because they can already see this child doing it well and they see that everyone likes hearing that. Oh, she did such a good job. His bow is so straight. You, look at those feet. They're fantastic. And because we go, wow, this is really terrific. Our student child over here goes, oh, I want that. I want to put, oh, I will need to make my bow hold better so I can keep the bow straight. We generally don't need to, to bash that in 18 times. We can let natural consequences happen. Oh, 
your bow was crooked. Why is that? Oh, because the thumb's straight. What will happen if we make the thumb bed? Ah, your bow's straight. Natural consequences, great way to learn. And again, it's all sensible. There's nothing abstract about this. Later on, we, we get into abstracts, I'm sorry. But in the early days, we have a very simple equation of cause and effect and natural consequences. And I think the more that we can let learning happen and focus on creating the environment rather than trying to create the learning, um, the better luck we have. And I, I struggle with this constantly. I live my life in a constant state of tension between putting my energy into the environment and pushing my energy into the learning. The more I push energy into the learning or the, oh no, that, that's a C sharp, make your finger higher. The worse my life gets, the more I focus on the environment. Does that really sound like that? Can you check? Ah, oh, I, I can play it for you on the CD or you could grab the book and have a look. The learning happens, but the more I push, the less it happens. And that's actually not a quick process. I have some things I've been you know, shoving on and if I suddenly stop shoving, there is still a period of pushback. Even though I'm not pushing anymore, there's still a period of, well, where are the new boundaries and why don't you care and aren't you gonna help me? And when I am consistent in stepping back and saying, no, you know what, you can probably work that out. Yeah, have a look here or did you, did you think of checking this thing? Mm, I don't know, maybe. The resources are all there, they're all accessible. As long as the resources are there, they're easily accessible and that also means easily accessible. If your child can't decode sheet music, that's not easily accessible. So then we have to scaffold accessibility into that and that might be writing the fingers in or it might be writing the semitones and tones in. So when I say easily accessible, I don't mean can pick up the book. It actually means can pick up the book, can find the location of the information, can pass the information and can draw meaning from the information. And then that's accessible. But if we keep picking or getting the book off the shelf and finding the right page and say, here you are, it's on the fourth line. And it says, um, our kids aren't going to develop that willingness to be wrong or the willingness to go and learn um, because we're doing it for them. And it's much easier to have mom and dad do the work for you all the time. But once they do the work themselves on little tiny things like, uh, you can put your clothes in the washing machine. Yeah, you can, you can probably run a load. Yeah, do you want some help? No, you got it? Okay. <laughs> the little things breed the big pieces of confidence that give them the idea of, I can raise a thousand dollars for charity. I can go overseas. I can, I can, I can. And you, at the, bat, the battle for us at the moment is, uh, can you write a short, a short story about the piano piece? Short story? No. Can write beautifully, has lovely handwriting, isn't sure about spelling, won't ask because that will show everyone I don't know what I'm doing. Therefore, we're not writing a short story about short story. So what do we do? We just keep saying, ah, I bet you can't read me that Dr. Seuss book. You know, set it some kind of challenge in five minutes, in three minutes, whatever. Silly stuff. Uh, or can you do all the voices? Choosing um, reading repertoire with very high frequency repetition of words to build confidence in the simple vocabulary so that then we feel like we can do maybe 90% of the task and we're happy to help ask for help with the remaining 10% rather than, <gasps> I can't write any which is a bit of anxiety kicking in. I can't write any words, so I'm not even going to try. Instead, my current task is scaffolding so that that becomes attainable. Um, and that might sound complex, but if you break it into chunks, like always, and think, okay, let's pretend that I have no idea how to write a story, where would you start? Well, maybe by looking at other stories, fairy stories. They all start the same way. They've all got a bit of a plot line of something bad happening and then something good happening. This is what we do. We build connections and 
Now I have to trust that I have put the resources in the environment. I have made them accessible. I have made them interesting and real. And that with time, the skill's going to develop. But my job now is to let it happen. And that's really hard. So if you want to look at more of John Holt's stuff, How Children Learn, I do recommend um, downloading on your Kindle the revised edition because I appreciate someone who came back and questioned their own stuff 20 years later and added more layers to it. And I think there's a lot to be learned just from his attitude to life. So I hope this has been of some use.